In this video I'm going to demonstrate emulating the Grundy New Brain computer and then after that I will go through the uh, architecture of the actual computer because it's a bit more complicated than the computers which I've emulated so far and then finally I'll go over the source code of the actual emulation software. So this is the actual Grundy New Brain and as you can see it takes a while for it to boot up to the command prompt uh, so that's one of the things I'm not, not so keen on about this computer. There's things I like and things I don't don't really like about it. If I just move the cursor up, you see at the bottom of the screen, it's got a, a multi-segment display uh, where in physically on the actual computer itself, it actually had a 16 character dis display. So it could actually run off of batteries as well, technically, because it had the battery pack you could buy for it. And you could just run it off of that um, single character display. And as you move the cursor around, you can actually use it to edit text and code and things on the actual computer. Um, if I just type in a simple program like I usually do, which is just to display the character set, because it's the same kind of program on all computers uh, using BASIC. So. As you can see, it's got lowercase and uppercase characters in the character set for the computer. And the computer slate, uh, it comes up with an error at the end. If you, you have to type an end statement on the end of the program to prevent that from happening. Uh, that's one of the other things which I'm uh, not too keen about. No other computer which I've um, used ha ha makes you do that. So I'm not sure quite, what, quite why that was. Um, and also I can uh, actually get it to auto type in some programs which came out of the actual menu, uh, the manual for the Grundy New Brain. So graphics, so actual graphics on the computer is done differently to other computers as well. So there's a what you've seen so far is just a character display where it looks up the characters from a character ROM and displays them on the display and it does that in hardware. So that's quite common to other computers. Uh, but when you want to actually display graphics, it splits the display in two. So you tell it how big the area you want for the high res graphics and it will place that area at the bottom of the display and anything remaining you'll still be able to use as character display at the top of the display. So here you can see at the bottom of the display it's actually displaying some graphics and these are just some stuff out of the user manual for the Grundy New, new Brain. Um, uh, but at the top of the display I still have uh, a character display which becomes more apparent in if I just break into this program and load the pie chart example from the Again, this is from the user manual. It's a bit of a longer program, this one, to actually type in. So I'm glad I've got this facility where I can just get it to auto-type the program in. Um, and it's gone, when I broke out of that last program, it goes back to the character display again. Uh, but on this one, it opens up two displays. So that's one of the, actually one of the positive things about this computer is you can open up multiple displays and you can leave the displays memory intact and then you can open up another display and display something else and then go back to the previous display because it's still in memory so you can like switch around uh, displays uh, it's which is quite complicated from a programmer's point of view if you're like a beginner programmer but it's quite a good facility to have on such an early computer uh, so this one that's currently being typed in is the pie chart example from the user manual and it draws a pie chart so at the bottom of the screen you can see that it's drawing the circle in the graphics area and then at the top of the screen it's prompting me for a title for the graph so I've just put example title and when I hit return it then renders that within the graphics area and I, it renders it because it's not drawing it from the character ROM it's, at ROM, it's actually plotting it on the, uh, on the high resolution display so put, uh, for just for ease, easy calculating 100 as the maximum for the pie chart then I just put sub A for heading A, 10, and it draws on the actual pie chart the first segment for sub A, and I'll make sub B the second one as well, 25. It, keeps, it allows me to keep entering values. Uh, and then just to make it easy to remember what the last value I'm going to put in is if you put in that value which is too high it will prompt you and tell you how much is left so put 15 in there and that then finishes the pie chart so that shows the combined character 
um, character element of the screen at the top and pixel element of the screen at the bottom. And you can open up the pixel element of the screen any number of lines you want up to the full screen. Uh, so here it's taken up probably about three quarters of the display and then a quarter of the display at the top is the character display. So if, it, if I hit new line and see it came back with the actual listing itself. So it, this is because this screen is in a different part of memory. So you can open up as many character or graphic displays as you want and it remembers uh, where they were. So it's now uh, resumed back to the system display. Uh, so if we go on to the next example from the manual. So for the segment display, it's just an example that you can program what you want to put onto the segment display. And uh, first of all, it will use poke commands to actually poke values onto the segment display. And then the second part is to actually display. So that's poking items to the display. They can print to uh, stream three, which is there, uh, to actually put something on display as well. So just dem demonstrating putting stuff on the display uh, the segment display in two different methods and that was again from the manual uh, and then my last example is the blitz game which I make a conversion of this for all of the whenever I demonstrate a computer on an emulator I always put my a, a version of it for that computer onto the computer just so you can see it running as it would do uh, and you can compare it from computer to computer or emulator to emulator if you look back from my videos uh, so this is quite a short program, so it shouldn't take long to actually for it to get typed in with the uh, emulator itself. Uh, and then when it runs, all I have to do is one key game. I just have to press any key on the keyboard to drop a bomb. You only drop one bomb at a time. You have to try and clear the city to actually land the plane. So it's pretty much there now. I think in a few more lines it will be complete. Yeah, the new brain itself isn't when you actually display stuff or list stuff, it's not as fast as other computers to do that, but other things it is quite fast at doing. So now it's displaying the start, the start of the game. So it kind of makes up for some things in some ways. It's not really a games machine. I don't think it was really ever because the actual keyboard input for the basic is, is like a character input like you would get on CPM, like a terminal. So it's like a terminal machine rather than um, rather than a games machine. It kind of, I guess it was halfway between home computers and uh, the computers which came out, which originally were for hobbyists and th and things like that, which used terminals uh, to actually display characters on the, on the on the display. Whereas the home computers then came more into like graphics displays uh, and. And doing things like games and applications, or more graphical applications, whereas the initial ones really were only interested in typing things in, really. And so that's why they only really read a character at a time and displayed them a character at a time. That's historically where they came from the early computers. I mean, even before, even before the micro microprocessors, uh, the early computers used terminals, uh, which were teletype terminals, which were mechanical terminals to actually enter data into them. So if if you actually go back through the history of computing, you actually see like an evolution uh, going from one part to the next to the next. So even to the modern IBM PCs, if you go into a terminal on a modern IBM PC, a DOS box or a or a command prompt on Linux, uh, that's all done around a character terminal. So that harks back to the original days of the terminal, even in most modern computers. So this is a brief overview of the hardware on the Grundy computer uh, which will help when I go for the source code uh, to understand a bit more how the source code is working so in the middle here we've got this the Z80 CPU and just like any other computer it's got um, ROM and RAM uh, but at boot up over here it needs to bring the ROM which is at address E000 down to address 0000 so it can boot up because the Z80 starts at zero address uh, where it's starting its execution but by default there's RAM down there uh, so in order to boot it needs to bring the one of the ROMs briefly down um, to the bottom of memory uh, so that it can execute jump instruction and then it can release that and put RAM back at the bottom of memory and that's done so that it can run CPM because CPM required RAM to be down at the bottom of memory. Uh, the actual video display is done in TTL logic so 
this over here is TTO logic, which is capable of displaying 40 or 80 columns or pixel data to the display. And that takes um, the actual data it needs directly out of memory, out of, out of RAM, and then displays it onto the VGU. But over the other side, we've got microcontrollers. So microcontrollers were very rare back in the eight, eight, early 80s. I think this was probably around 83. There weren't many around, but this was quite a common one apparently for use in things. Although you didn't get many microcontrollers used in desktop computers back then either. So this is quite a, a rare architecture for a computer. And the, the, what they did was they handed off the processing of the of information for segment display because in order to display things on a segment display, it has to scan across the segment display. It takes up a bit of processing time, so they handed off that process into the COP microcontroller. And also scanning the keyboard doesn't take that much processing time because you see it done in most other computers. The actual CPU itself will do it. Uh, but I guess because they thought, well, we've got a microcontroller to do the segment display, well, we can hand off all the processing for the keyboard there as well. And for the cassette reading and writing to the cassette storage, we'll get the microcontroller to do that. So that does take a, a fair bit of load off of the CPU itself. Uh, and the CPU then is free to do other things. So unlike the TRS-80, which is the previous computer which I emulated, uh, and I didn't have a character ROM for the TRS-80, so I had to actually do the character ROM myself. I had to create one from scratch. Uh, on the new brain, it does have the characters in the standard system ROM. So uh, the hardware for the display actually takes the characters out of the system ROM and displays them on the display. But I have here a source code which I needed to do for the the segment displays. So the segment displays which are actual physical hardware on the computer. There's no ROM for them because it it uses a, a microcontroller to actually display them. So I guess all the information is within that microcontroller, which I don't have access to. So here I've just done a set of data which represents the actual characters as they would be displayed on the multi-segment display. And it's just um, for all of the characters available, 128 of them. They're defined in the, the technical user manual, which is available for the new brain computer. So I didn't actually have to just um, improvise these characters. They're actually taken from actually what characters actually displayed within that manual. So this is the source code for the emulator for the new brain computer, which is going to be slightly more complicated than other computers which I've emulated for so far, uh, because it has more ports which need to be defined because the hardware is that much more complicated. But it still uh, doesn't require much software to actually emulate it. So at the top, you've just got um, some global variables which come from the Z80 emulator. So if you want to know more about the, Z the actual emulating the Z80 processor, way back on my original uh, emulating ZX80 and ZX81 computers, which is probably uh, about a year ago, maybe I, I, I'm not sure. It's, it's quite a while ago that I did those. I've actually explained in there how I emulate the Z80 microcontroller, uh, the actual microprocessor. Um, and that's just, it just goes for each instruction. It reads from memory and goes for a switch statement. And um, and all it does is move stuff from one memory location to another one uh, and perform whatever operation is required on, on the actual data that it reads and writes back. Uh, so I've got global variables which are required just for the new brain emulator. And some of them, like these ones here, are variables which need to be retained for ports. So when the new brain outputs something on the Z80 port, I need to retain that information because it's kind of held in uh, registers on in the hardware itself, uh, which why uh, they I've got them as global variables here. So I've my main entry point calls another entry point. So this is just in case I want to execute it as a single executable on a desktop of a computer or in a microcontroller if I want to actually emulate multiple of the machines together in one program I need to call this one um, this main new brain entry point because you can't redefine main multiple times within source code uh, and as like in previous 
emulators if you've seen my previous videos I set up the display um, so in this case it's a, a window an X window on the Linux machine I initialize the Z80 uh, processor emulation and then I load up the ROM into memory and it's loaded up at high memory so the Z80 it starts execution, execution down uh, at the bottom of memory uh, but so it needs to pull one of these ROMs down to low memory just temporarily at boot time in order to get the execution going and it jumps immediately the first instruction it does in low memory is jump to high memory and then it can release the the EEPROM from low memory and the RAM then replaces it back again at low memory uh, and that's required for running CPM and the new brain computer can run CPM uh, it has a disk interface which you can get through it and you one of the disks you can get is um, CPM to actually run on this computer like it's like I was saying when I was demonstrating the emulator um, in the early days it, the, most computers were terminal type computers whereas then uh, home computers uh, became more sort of graphical interfaces and this is kind of sits between the two so it's 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 still in the CPM days of terminal so that it runs CPM uh, but it it also it was a was put up as a home computer like uh, just at the start of the gaming days but it's not really capable of running games so a bit of an oddball this computer um and then i run i load my character rom up in high memory uh, so that i can emulate the character um hardware the character uh, displaying hardware and then i have to put uh, all my callbacks in so my Z80 emulator, it, what you do is you register for callbacks and so this one at the top here is for when a reset occurs on the CPU I can actually uh, perform actions to do that reset and the reason I need to do that in this particular case you won't see it in many of my emulators is because of that feature which pulls the ROM in high memory down to low memory so when you reset it needs to do that action of mapping that high ROM down just for the uh, point of view of getting that jump instruction to jump to high memory then it can release it so that's all I need that for and then I've got the clock callback so every, every clock cycle I can decide what to do and then I define all the um, port callbacks so you can see it's got a lot of IO ports on this machine compared to the Sinclair or TRS-80 machines uh, and each one has its own feature and there's a, a manual which you can get off of the internet which is the technical manual for the new brain computer and it explains all of this and it's what made this possible to actually emulate because I would never have been able to why well, it taken ages to reverse engineer this kind of thing but the technical manual of computers back in these days was accurate enough that you could actually well reproduce an emulator on know that they had that much information in them so I've got all of these ports here and I'll explain them as I go down through the code um, and then it just starts the emulation process off here where it jumps to the base address uh, then I just do some cleaning up before exiting so when it comes out of executing the emulator so here I have the callbacks so this is the reset callback and it just initializes the port flip-flop values so in the, it has the ports have registers which record what the value was that was last written to them or or which needs to go get read from back into the Z80 and this is where I'm mirroring memory from E000 down to the base the, the bottom of memory so that it can boot up uh, one of the ports is to reset an interrupt flag and that's all that this does now the actual hardware has like I said before a microcontroller which performs some of the operations for the keyboard segment display and cassette interface and so that all has to be emulated here now I don't actually have to emulate the, the microcontroller itself and the program within the microcontroller all I have to do is provide the features that the microcontroller provides because it's a fixed set of features uh, if the microcontroller could be reprogrammed on the fly then I'd probably have to emulate the actual instructions with the within the uh, microcontroller but lucky enough I don't have to do that I all I have to do is provide the features of this, this top bit here is for displaying things on the segment display and then down here it's about reading characters from the keyboard 
and I haven't implemented the set interface but so so it doesn't require much code to actually emulate the the actual microcontroller on this computer but I haven't it's not f um, fully implemented there be stuff that's undocumented which I haven't provided and so I it's difficult to know because I don't provide a full specification of that microcontroller and what it does it's difficult to know if how much I've actually provided but it provides enough to emulate it to the level that you've seen uh, in my previous part of this video uh, then the actual video display itself um, provides information so because the video is implemented in TTL logic it has registers which you can read to get the status of the video and I haven't used that at all um, and here I, it just sets a, um, a, a set of ver um, information for the hardware uh, which dictates how the hardware is enabled so interrupt, enabling interrupts and things like that um, and then there's two IO ports below that where the actual CPU can tell or the program which runs on the CPU the actual ROM for the new brain can tell the hardware the video hardware which address in memory to it needs to use to actually display on the display and that's how you get these opening of streams so when I was going through the demonstration you can open multiple stream uh, multiple streams to the display and each has its own set of memory so when you go back to a previous display the memory is still there and it displays what was there before so it can actually physically tell the, the video display hardware which is like I say is all in TTL logic where in memory to actually display the information that it's just going to display on the display and it can it can open up to 256 screens I think oh, of course there's probably not enough memory in a 64k new brain to actually open that many but it can oh you know in theory open that many displays and keep the data for it, that many displays there was an add-on for the new brain which was memory banking so you could actually expand the, the ram physical ram on it the machine a lot more and in that case you might want to open that many displays um, and then there's um, a register which is on a port which tells it about how the how things are enabled and oh this is the interrupt one I, I, which I was talking about earlier I'm not sure what that one above was then that I skipped over it didn't do much but this is about interrupts enabling as I come down uh, so this is the so this is the main one. So on most of my other emulators, you'll see that most it's basically this. Uh, this is a clock callback. So for every CPU cycle, it does something. And on here, I won't display. I won't do every uh, an action on every clock cycle because that would slow things down. Uh, usually, like at 50 hertz, the dis this display refresh speed, you you do something. And on here, you need to create interrupts for the actual new brain computer to so because it these interrupts are what the microcontroller do, uses for actually sending information backwards and forwards to the keyboard and, and for the video hardware which is down there as well and then i process key presses so i have to emulate a keyboard on the actual new brain computer and here i'm getting keystrokes from the actual uh computer my Linux computer's keyboard. I'm converting them into keystrokes which the new brain computer can would recognise, and I'm doing that in these kind of in this kind of area here where I'm looking up in a table what the actual new brain would understand that key key press to be. I'm adding whether or not the shift key is pressed uh, or the control key is pressed in a way that the new brain computer will understand, uh, and I'm creating an interrupt because the, the, I have to tell the microcontroller on the new brain that it, there's a keyboard key press uh, or the mic this is actually the microcontroller telling the <laughs> telling the new brain it gets a bit complicated telling the new brain rom that there's a uh, keyboard key press waiting for it because that's an interrupt on the z80 this is just for my debug purposes so i can break into the code using my debugger for my emulator and then there's this a bit more complicated for doing the video. So like I said, there's, there's three sets of video here. So the first set is rendering characters on the display. And each character here is looked up in the character ROM. 
uh, and then it's just rendered from the character ROM. So that's the top part of the display, however much is allocated to the character display. Then below that we've got the pixel display. So this is actually generating pixels to the display. So at the end of the character display, the pixel data starts in memory after that. And so at that point, we're just taking data bytes out of memory. So we're not looking up characters. We're just taking the data from memory and plotting it each, each point onto the display as yeah, pixel data. And the hardware also ha uh, is able to switch off the display. So in the case it switches off the display, this, this um, command here just displays a blank display. And then there's the third part of the display, which is the segment display, the segment characters display. And like the character display, I look up the actual conversion of the character that I want to actually display in my self-made ROM, uh, which would be the a lookup table in the COP microcontroller microcontrol on the new brain. And that converts it into seven segment displays information, which I can then display at the bottom of the display. And this bit at the bottom handles releasing interrupts after they've been processed.